All right, we're live on the Las Vegas Tri Club page and we're recording. I'm John Mercer. This is Ted Gerard. It's Friday night. It's time to talk triathlon. I'm evidence based triathlete. It's Black Friday. So that's why I wore black. You wore black. We're ready for it. That's right. Uh, we're, you know, I'm wearing a long sleeve. I don't know. You're wearing a shirt. Well, you, got, you have a shirt no, underneath. No, I, no, since we're talking about dressing and uh, training, in, uh, training in, the, in the cold. Yeah. So, John. I think it's interesting that you and I are talking about training the cold because, you know, you're from New York, yep. right? I'm from Canada originally. Um, and, and the weirdest thing is, is we both you know, were athletes when we were younger and uh, we didn't die training outside. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, people are, they always give me a hard time now when I'm in Las Vegas and, or when I go back to Canada in the summer and I'm freezing. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're just like, oh my gosh, like you're, 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 you know, you're so soft now. And I'm like, I'm not soft. I've changed. Right. <laughs> and, and our bodies change over time. But the trick of it is, is that when we do triathlon and we train, uh, our bodies don't adapt that fast. Mm -hmm. Right. It takes several years for your body to truly adapt to uh, training in different environments. Now, yeah, we can make, you know, training in heat, you can acclimatize takes three or four weeks. But you still don't get those long-term adap uh, adaptions. So, how do we survive, John? How well, do we... I, I don't know. Let me let me throw on a couple of stories on that because yep. it, you're right. It is perspective, and we'll probably come circling back around this because eventually we'll talk about wind chill, and that's really just a perception uh, of, of how cold you feel you are with the wind. But yep. yeah, you know. Um, I remember when we moved here in, in 99 to Vegas, it was, we were most recently in Eugene and we were going out in the winter and uh, you know, watching our kids play sports and we're in shorts and t-shirts and it, you know, probably in the seventies, eighties and we were loving it. Yep. <laughs> but now, you know, actually when they, when the boys got into high school by then, you know, even 10 years later, you know, we were going to watch sports, same, same temperature, but then we have a propane heater, take a sleeping <laughs> bag to sit in. Yep, big knitted hat. Oh, totally. It's just Plus, uh, and mitts. Yeah. The only thing that's changed is our, our perception of, of what was cold. And you know, then thinking back to you know skiing back east, you know, when we skied, it was cold. Yeah. It was it was it was it was always cold. And so when I took my boys skiing up at Mount Charleston as winter, and we were in t-shirts. And I kept having to tell them, I said, guys, you don't know what it's like. You know, when we skied back east, it was always cold. You always had to watch for frostbite. And now we're in t-shirts. And boy, that just, it's totally different. So, Yeah, but I do think it's different, but I, in perception, but there also is physiology. Yep. Right? Like you and I now being desert dwellers for, you know, you over 20 years, uh, both of us, our bodies have changed. And um it just we I mean, we're we're now acclimatized long term acclimatized to, to that so so the, then I guess the question is well what do we do now so we can train outside because our body once again it's going to acclimatize but it's not going to acclimatize that quickly especially when you're only out let's say you go for a run mm -hmm. you go for forty five minutes or an hour run in the cold mm -hmm. uh, or what we perceive as cold right we're not going to acclimatize to that so what do we do no you're right and and. And, and, and just to add to that, make it more complex is as we get older, our ability to adapt to, to environmental temperatures does change. And so uh, that happens uh, as, as well as just a perception. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know, we, we didn't check where we wanted to start, but um, we've actually done, uh, I've, I've done some core temp work and uh, actually used the core temp pill during some different races. So we can look at some core temp data, but I don't know how to answer your question and tell you the truth in terms of, of what's changed other than, uh, you know, it, it, it is partly a perception of, of how cold uh, you feel you are. And, uh, you know, we have receptors in our skin to be able to pick that up. And then it's our brain interpreting what that, hey, Cosmo, Cosmo. interpreting what, <laughs> what we feel is cold. And, you know, sometimes the way I think of it, again, this is just more anecdotal, is a, you know, five degree change in the air temperature is a five degree change in the air temperature. So uh, there is, you know, if you go from 80 to 85 or 70 to 75, probably not linear, but, uh, you know, there, that's still a big swing in temperature. So, yeah. 
you know, um, and, and, and I, I know some of the data and the interesting thing is, is that realistically core temperature doesn't change that much, right? Um, especially when we're, especially when we're training in the cold, because one of the mechanisms we, you know, that we really have in general, it, when we're too cold is we're going to shiver, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to help us warm up. And what is shivering? It's just autonomic muscular contraction. Well, instead of doing it, you know, via the autonomic system, we're, we're doing it. We're, 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 we're actually, you know, making the decision to, to move our muscles. Um, I, you know, I go usually every year I go to Canada at Thanksgiving or at Christmas and I run because I can't ride when I'm there. So we run and we swim when we're there. And I've done some minus 30 runs, some mm -hmm. minus 20 runs. And, you know, I don't think I, you know, my core temperature didn't, didn't drop very drastically. The one thing that I did have happen or do have happen is my toes and my hands get really cold. Yeah. And so as long as I have the appropriate things on my feet and on my hands, I'm good. And my face, you know, like bare skinny, bare skin. So like, when I'm there, it's interesting. I, I, I actually have some pictures of it. I have, I wear ski goggles mm -hmm. when I'm, when I'm running. Um, and then I wear like, uh, you know, I wear a winter cycling. Yeah, we're, exactly. I wear a winter cycling Jersey yep. and really thick mitts and usually hand warmers in it, yep. but, I'm, but I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I'm not shivering. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. It takes an awful lot to get you to shiver while you're exercising. Yeah. So let's back up and let's, you know, you, you mentioned, I've mentioned core temp, you mentioned core temp. Core temp is what we measure. And obviously, you know, our current uh, culture is we are all measuring core temperature a lot. Yeah. To, you know, your fitness area or shop or whatever. And they're measuring. Your core I would temp. say none of us are measuring core temperature. <laughs> well, that's what they're trying to get. <laughs> we're doing surrogates for core temperature, but we're not actually measuring core temperature. Okay, right? so core temperature obviously is the temperature of your core inside. Gold standard for core temperature is a rectal thermometer. Yep. Uh, another uh, way that we've been getting to core temperature and measuring in real time is an ingestible core temperature pill. So that goes inside you. And then the other ways to start getting core temperature is, you know, taking, you know, temperature at the forehead or under your tongue or uh, even inside your ear uh, at this point. Uh, but skin temperature in general is not a great predictor of core temperature. No. And, and I'll, I'll anecdotally tell you this. So uh, for our pool where we were, were swimming, it, uh, they take our temperature every time, right? And most Saturday mornings, I, I would run to the pool and then swim after. And when it was really hot, like over 100 degrees during the day, I mean, I guess the run was probably only 90 degrees. I would get there and my, core, my skin temperature would be 96, 97, mm -hmm. right? Even though it's blazing hot outside, but I'm doing a really good job of keeping myself relatively cool as I'm exercising, right? So it's interesting that it's, it's, it really isn't a great surrogate. Like the skin itself, you can keep your skin, especially when you're exercising relatively cool, even in, even in really hot environments. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta get, you gotta go pretty far down the road uh, as far as like, you know, the heat side of things to, to, to uh, change your skin temperature. Yeah, and so what you're, what you're getting to as well is this concept of what we call heat balance. Yep. That uh, we need to balance, you know, the body wants to maintain core temperature near, in a very narrow band. If it gets out, outside that narrow band, that can get dangerous, either too low, hypothermic, or too high, hyperthermic. Uh, those are bad, and we try to avoid those. Now, being in Vegas, we tend to focus on the high temperature uh, more so than low temperature, but uh, this time of year, it's still, you know, you got to pay attention to uh, getting too, uh, too cold. And so now you've got this heat balance, you've got a scale. And if you are exercising and you're building up heat, your body has to get rid of the heat in order to maintain that balanced temperature. Uh, and, and likewise, if your uh, environment is, is warm, that's going to tip the scales to uh, bringing in too much heat. And again, your body needs to do whatever it can uh, to balance that heat 
either gain or loss uh, so that you stay in that, that narrow range. And gain can come from, and you mentioned shivering, mentioned exercise, that's muscle contraction. Muscle contraction is only about 25 to 30% efficient in terms of getting energy uh, to, uh, from the chemical state to the mechanical state. So the other 70, 75% of that energy is typically just given off as heat. It is heat. So that's why when you shiver, it's a real effective way to warm yourself up because it's generating heat. And same thing with exercise. The harder you exercise, the more muscles you're recruiting and uh, the more conversion of chemical energy to mechanical energy, but a lot more conversion to heat energy. And so you're building that heat up and you gotta either retain it or get rid of it depending on the environment. And, and, and so anyways, you're, you're exactly right. So that being said, when we go for, let's talk about, let, let's just talk about running because it's, it's, for, it's such a ubiquitous thing that we do. Um, we'll get into cycling. So if we go for a run, let's say, I don't know, what have the early morning temperatures been? Like 40? Yeah. Right now, and they'll get down, you know, as we get into yeah. December and January, it'll get into like the, the 30s, right? Fahrenheit, because we're, we're Fahrenheit, yeah. So close to zero, <laughs> right? So, so we're going getting close to the freezing mark. So, what would you do, John? As far as, and I'm not talking about warming up or anything, because we can we, we talked a lot about warm up. But as far as clothing, what would what would you do if you're going to go? I don't know. Just let's say a five mile run. Yeah. So in the thirty, anything below forty, it's easy to dress for. Yep. Anything um, above 70, it's easy to dress for. The harder ones is that middle range where it's cold in the beginning or it feels cold in the beginning, but then you actually warm up and, uh, and, and actually have often have overdressed. But so for under 40, uh, I, I tend to wear, if, it's, if I'm just going for an easy run or easy bike ride, uh, I'll, I'll tend to dress warm meaning uh, I'll, I'll wear several layers. And I really uh, pay attention to, um, when biking, pay attention especially to extremities like feet and hands. And uh, in running, um, you know, not so much feet and hands because it, uh, I don't know that, that uh, I'll still wear um, some nice gloves depending on how cold it gets. But, um, but yeah, biking especially, I really pay attention to heat uh, or to the um, uh, to the hands and, and feet. But for okay, so to answer your question for running, I wear a pair of sweatpants. So I actually brought up my basket, my bin of warm gear. So I'll wear a pair of sweatpants, um, and then I'll wear for uh, clothing uh, for upper body. I'll wear some type of um, layer, just a thin layer. Uh, something that still allows the sweat to get through. And then again, uh, depending on temperature, how many other layers I'll put on 30 to 40, I'll probably wear even something like a, uh, another tech shirt, long sleeve tech shirt, and then maybe something a little bit more like a fleece uh, or a sweatshirt uh, on top of that. If the wind is a factor, like if it's quite windy, then I'll put on a layer uh, to protect from wind. So even something, even something simple like this uh, to wear on top of all that, uh, just to keep the, the wind from blowing over everything. So then the $10,000 question, or maybe it's the $1,000 question, depending on the treadmill you, you have, why just not run on a treadmill? Why not run on a treadmill? Like instead, well, just like, forget it. Just like, you know, you, you just run on a treadmill. Yeah, one, I don't have a treadmill in my house. So that's there you one. go. <laughs> and neither but, do I. But, and, you know, and, and that is a decent option, but I actually enjoy running in the cooler temperature. It just, <laughs> and, and maybe it's because, you know, I grew up in the Northeast and you know, we were running in, you know, in the winter, it was just cold. I just enjoyed that. You know, even running in snow, it was actually quite pleasant. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problems in running in the Northeast was uh, slippery roads. And really had a the biggest problem. Yeah, you really had to watch, uh, you know, what to what to wear on the feet. And in Vegas, you do need to be careful because you 
you do go out for a morning run and you do have ice out there from the different you know, people left their sprinklers on yep. overnight. <laughs> yeah, you know, it can turn into a skating rink really quick. You know, I know, uh, same thing when I go to Canada, uh, I actually have specific shoes that are, they're like a Nike trail shoe. Mm-hmm. They were there as a really gummy bottom yep. uh, for that very reason. Because invariably in December when we're there, it will, there will be snow and ice yep. um, on, the, on the ground and on the roads and places that I, I would want to run. And even like, you know, someone would shovel their sidewalk and the next person wouldn't. Yeah, right, right, right. And so I think that's important. Um, the other thing I think is important that we will talk about, well, at least we can talk about it now, is it makes a huge difference too if you have uh, radiant heating, mm-hmm. right? So if the sun is out yep. versus sun not out. So for me, at like let's say 35, 40 degrees, if the if it's a sunny day in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. I could go in a t-shirt and as long as I have gloves on, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. But if it's if it's shady or let's say the sun has just gone down, let's say it's after work and I'm gonna get in a run, that's a totally different ball game. That's true. And, and radiant, you know, radiant heating is is something we're really lucky in Las Vegas we have because mm-hmm. what is it like 330 days of sun a year, mm-hmm. and so you can almost guarantee you're going to have a, a sunny day. That being said, if every day you're going out running and it's 40 degrees or, or biking, it's 40 degrees, you wear the same thing, same thing, same thing, and then one day it's cloudy, it could be a different it could be a different choice of what you uh, what you wear. The one thing I'll add when it's cold for me, and I think I mentioned it already, is I'll wear a cycling jersey because uh-huh. um, I have some really nice uh, ones that are very, they're good for the wind and they have zippers underneath the arms. Yep. And so for running, I, re- I really like that because I can open up that zipper under my arms and still ventilate some. Um, and then I, I like it too because then I get pockets in my back. You know, I can, so if I want to take my gloves off or my hat off, I can slap them in those pockets in the in, in the cycling jersey and uh you know i don't remember who, t- who told me that it was a triathlete at some point said you know in the winter wear your cycling jerseys because you can you that's know, a good you idea you yeah. can carry your gloves and your hat and even yeah. different you know two pairs of gloves one like a really thin pair one you know one thicker um and i you know i've really always thought that was a good idea and um so and i, I think a lot of people have like a long sleeve cycling jersey mm-hmm. no that's a great idea and and the hat you gotta. We both mentioned a hat. I don't think I focused on, but you gotta have a good hat. You gotta have a good hat. Yeah, I, it's. I know I have a couple of different ones. I have a really thin, you know, thin kind of skull cap thing, and I've got some really thick or knitted. Uh, in Canada, we call them toques. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Here they called in, they called beanies, but uh, you know those those are important. You know, I've really noticed my beanies been important. My toques been important. Uh, we've been swimming outside. And at night, getting out of the pool at like eight thirty, that's been it's been a pretty quick put that uh, put that baby on for sure. Okay, so let's talk about cycling because I think running is actually relatively easy. I think cycling is is way more the ch- the challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing I'll add is uh, last year in particular, and maybe it's because I had a I had a my, my shoulder a shoulder issue last year. I spent a lot of time indoors. Yeah, training. Um, you know, it's with the days being short, uh, it was just, it, it's just easy, right? You got your trainer set up, you're, 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 you get your Zwift or your Ruby or whatever. Um, it, it doesn't take a lot of effort. And I missed it, actually. I really started thinking about it, Like, I missed riding outside. Because uh, I actually, same thing, I enjoy, like, one of the best parts of living in Las Vegas, we have the sun, right? And even on the shorter days, I still love getting out there uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I have a, uh, a lower tolerance for the, for cold, windy days in the winter. That's yeah. for sure. Even though I have all the gear I could possibly need to do it. Right. Um, you know, if it was, you know, let's say 35 degrees and windy mm-hmm. the winter, I'm probably not going outside. That's cold. You know, that it's, and, and you're right. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have the right gear. Yep. Yeah, if you have the right gear, it's it can be more fun than if you have the wrong gear. You made the wrong choices going out the door. Uh, yep. Then it's a miserable day, uh, and that's the beauty of, of Vegas. You know, especially even this time of year. I mean, it's cool in the morning, but it warms up nice. But that means you've got to be ready to change your gear along the way. Yeah, you can't use the same gear 
you know, oh, like on a four hour ride, it's gonna, you're, you're definitely needing, needing to change gear yep. to change. Yep. Yeah. But you know, when I, if it's below, again, you know, my threshold is typically for decisions is under 40 on the bike that I'm making a lot more careful decisions because I want to be comfortable. And, uh, you know, now typically, you know, every year I, I'll commute to work and I'll, I'll commute year round. But when I'm commuting into work, what was it right now or not, but you know, when I am commuting to, into work around this time of year, I re I dress as if I'm almost going to go skiing. Yep. So especially in the morning coming in and at night, right? If it's, if, yeah. if you don't get out of work till after dark, you know, four fifteen, four thirty, 4 mm -hmm. it's cold coming home. Yep. No, totally. And, and that's right. Once the sun goes down, that radiant heat isn't available. And now that heat balance, uh, is a problem because now you're generating heat, but you're also losing that heat to the environment if you don't have the right the right clothing. If you got the right clothing, it can be actually quite comfortable. And I do a lot of, you know, it's a lot of traffic lights coming home too and the bike, so a lot of start and stopping. So one of my biggest weapons for biking, balaclava. Yeah. So uh, I I use a pretty thick one. I actually have a a knitted one, and then I also have a um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the fabric. Um, like a wool? No, it's not wool. It's this um, this fleece type of uh, of fabric. So like mic micro fleece. Yeah, micro fleece. So uh, this one I tend to uh, sweat more in, and it tends to retain the sweat a little bit, which can be a problem because then uh, if you just get wet, and then if the the material starts to get wet then it loses its insulating properties. So that, that's a problem. But, um, and you mentioned ski goggles, you know, this back East is what I used to do is bike in the winter because we didn't have indoor trainers back then. I'd wear ski goggles because uh, I'd wear a balaclava covering the nose. I'd have my ski goggles on, yep. you know, cover as much skin as you can. And uh, it's actually quite comfortable. And I've done a couple of rides here, not too many here in Vegas with my ski goggles on, so. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting is if you don't have bare skin, oh. you're you're good. Like yeah. for the most part, you're good. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any other than the Bella Clav and the ski goggles, any like just kind of tips that maybe maybe people wouldn't wouldn't know? Um, well, gear wise, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll stick with the well, two things um, I wear. Again, I'm commuting. I'll wear ski gloves. Yep. But even when I go for a ride, I'll wear ski gloves. You know, you know, again, under 40 for sure. Uh, I'm taking care of the hands because when it starts to get cold, as you mentioned, your body's going to adapt by trying to keep more blood near the core because the blood is trans is um, is is uh, circulating heat in essence. And uh, so you want to keep that heat near the core. So now your extremities are not getting that heat. So now you've got to have something to keep yourself warm. Uh, but I know actually before I go to my next one, I'll, I'm going to punt back to you because I know you told uh, Laura one that she uses to date. Yeah. So, you, so it's not the most environmentally friendly one, but uh, it's great. I, you know, when I commute into work, same thing. I got, you know, it's cold and my ride in is really cold usually because I'm downhill coming from Summerlin to, to UNLV that's downhill. Um, so I tape, I turn on the, or I buy, uh, well, it's like I buy those little hot, sh I don't even know what they're called, hot packs, heat yeah. packs. Yeah. You open them up and you shake them. You, yeah. you buy them at Costco, I think you get like 40 of them for 10 bucks. Yeah. And I tape them. I just take electrical tape and I tape them to my handlebars. Mm -hmm. And just holding on to those, you know, you're going to have a little bit lighter glove, which I like. like. The one thing I don't like about ski gloves is it's hard to shift sometimes, yeah. right? especially with the DI2, the little buttons. Um, so I do that. And then even for racing, um, if I'm gonna race and it's gonna be a cold, especially a cold swim, mm -hmm. I take them to my arrow bars, to my hand, to where I hold on. And it's just, it feels so good to have that warm in your hands, especially when you get out of the cold water. So I started doing it with that and then I started doing it commuting. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that is pro tip is to I think that, electric tape and do that. That's a great tip. And, uh, you know, you told Laura that and she's picked up on that. She uses them during racing. Yep. Uh, and, and they are handy to have. And 
uh, and it does, and they do help. So, but you mentioned during racing, I'll use, and I actually posted this on um, on Facebook because some folks were getting ready. Matt and he was getting ready for Arizona. Unfortunately, yeah. got canceled, and wondering whether or not it was going to be cold. And you don't want to toss away your thirty dollar, you know, arm warmers or gloves or what have you. So I said, no, just get some tube socks. Yep. Go to the store, get some tube socks, and cut a little slit. Where is it? There's a little slit in there, and then you've got three dollar arm coolers, and you can double them up as as gloves at the same time. So with that little toe box or toe off. And you still get your phone, or you can wrap around, you can bike like this, or take it off entirely, and now you get hand free. And you don't want them, throw them out because they cost three bucks. And all it took was a little cut. And uh, I usually take a little uh, fire. That's a, little. that's a great tip, by the way, because that's the you know, let's say you know, you're not riding outside very often, but you're yeah, your friend's gonna go and, and, and do a ride, and you're gonna jump on with them, and maybe you don't have arm warmers, yeah, just yeah. just do that. Yep. Oh, these are just as good as my thirty-dollar arm warmers. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, on a race, on a on a, if it's going to be a, a potentially cold race, I'll actually put a pair in T1, uh, put them in my special needs if it's a long uh, race. Uh, I'll put them in T2, and I'll put them in my special needs on the run too, because these are great to have on the run if you're just trying to adapt to the environment and you need a little extra layer on your extremities. Yep. So, um, any other golden tips? Feet, uh, I don't mess around with feet. I wanna keep my feet warm. So obviously there's socks and you can really mess around with good socks. But I also, um, you when I to do Norseman, I actually made sure I was really prepared. And Norseman could be rainy, it could be cold. So I actually got some Gore-Tex uh, uh, gaiters for uh, cycling. So they open up on the bottom so your feet can still uh, operate on your pedal. And I love wearing these in the winter. They take a second to put on, they just Velcro on. And uh, my feet don't have, I don't, I don't have any problems with my feet uh, when I'm cycling. I, I maybe look a little um, overdressed, but I'm warm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my, I always say if my hands and toes are warm, I'm happy. Yeah. So I do something similar with my feet. I, you know, I wear the neoprene toe covers to yes. a certain point, and then I have a like I have a set like that, but they're quilted. Yeah. They're like a like a you know like a quilted jacket, and uh, they're not good for for rain necessarily. But in Vegas, you know, it's not like we get. You know, it, it, tell you what, if it's gonna be a rainy day in the winter, I'm probably not gonna ride yeah. outside. And, and me either, because then it's just you gotta you gotta really you know work on your bike afterwards. So. Yeah, exactly. Maybe if we lived in Seattle or something, I might yeah, yeah. or Vancouver where it's raining all the time in the winter. Yep. But okay. we don't we don't we don't have to do that. Well, when I was doing my um my uh, work up in Oregon, Eugene, uh, then I had a serious rain kit, and you know, yep. and you didn't mess around because it, it's no fun if you get wet. So I would have a real heavy duty uh, rain gear for uh, for biking up there, and and mostly again commuting uh, at that point. So. Uh, not worrying so much about aerodynamics for commuting. It was more just functional. So speaking of aerodynamics, that's actually another one of my um, pro tips is in the winter, wear your aero helmet. Ah. Right? Or They're way warmer. There's, there's no venting. At least mine has basically no venting. I get the shield across. Yeah. My ears are covered. I, I'm quite happy uh, wearing my aero helmet in the, in the winter. That's a great idea. In fact, I have not had this helmet. Um, this would, in essence, be just like yep. you know my ski goggles. So yep. And then this way, and your ear and your ears are covered. Yeah, that's right. And I actually love bracing this because you are in that little bubble. Yep. Uh, so no, that would be that's a great tip. So. Yep. so that's that's definitely one that I like is to is to wear that. The other one, um, and you know, we don't have to plug brands or anything, but the one of the best things I ever did was buy um, these jerseys. They're they're they made by Castelli. Mm -hmm. These be called the Gabba jersey. They they lost the some somehow there was a patent issue with the name, 
yep, that's it right there. And um, they uh, they can't call it GABA anymore. Right. It's called Profeto. Okay. The, and those are, they're windproof, waterproof, yeah. they're flexible. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're a little expensive. You know, you can find them sometimes on sale for about 120 bucks. That's right. Um, but I'm telling you, best thing ever. Do you have that? Is yours one that the sleeves come off? Yep. No, yep. I, I, they come off and I, they've turned into a vest, which again is great for around here if you're, yep. um, you know, starting in the morning and going to the afternoon. So they have ones that are they're good, that's called convertible, and then they have just a long sleeve. And then they all, and the, the nice thing with the long sleeve, as I was talking about the running, that's the one that has the zipper underneath, mm -hmm. where the convertible doesn't have the zipper underneath. And then they also make a short sleeve. And actually, I've been really into the short sleeve, and I wear the short sleeve with arm warmers, because then I can just, you know, if it gets a little too hot, slide the arm warmers off. And uh, for me, that jacket around 30, I'm pretty comfortable if I would put a t shirt underneath it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm feeling pretty good. And then on my bottoms, I wear, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know anybody, first of all, I don't know anyone that can wear leg warmers or leg coverings that is actually like them or knee coverings or anything. They sell them I, and I bought them uh, at one point mm. and I've talked to so many cyclists and they, you know, most of them just, they can't stand them. Yeah. And so I wear, I found a pair of like three quarter length pants, like knickers. Yeah. So I wear those and then just a really long pair of socks mm -hmm. or uh, calf, uh, calf sleeves, like compression calf sleeves, mm -hmm. just a looser pair of compression calf sleeves. And uh, then my, my legs are fine. If my knees are just showing a little bit, it doesn't really bother me. No, that's good. So again, if I'm in that threshold temperature range, I've, I've got two choices. I'll, I'll do tights more so than uh, warmers. Yeah. If I'm, you know, it, if it's over 40, then I probably would start in, uh, in leg warmers to, because I'll probably take them off at some point. But then if it starts getting down, you know, near in the thirties, um, I'm actually going to wear a windproof uh, type of pant that's actually got a fleece inside it. Yeah. And again, I'm not worried about this is training, and I'm not worried about looks, obviously. <laughs> so, but I'm I'm building this nice shell that uh, I can stay very comfortable on and go for a nice long ride, and yep. be really uh, quite pleasant uh, during that ride. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm the same with you. In the winter, it doesn't matter what I look like. It's, it's more about just, you know, being functional and being warm. And then you, you obviously need your buff. Yeah. Right. And if you don't have a Las Vegas Tri Club buff, you got to get one. You got to get one. They're great for uh, neck or if you're, you know, maybe you don't want to have a heavy hat and you can put this on as a hat. Yep. So I think we did a pretty good job of covering the, uh, um, that but what do we do john and this is this happens to a lot I mean, i've had a lot of people asking this question about what happens when you like when you're riding and you and then you get really sweaty and then you get cold yeah well that's the problem because once your gear gets wet it loses its insulating properties yep and it can actually make things worse and so uh, you have to uh be careful about you know fluids coming either from internal from sweating or from the environment, uh, rain or snow, you know, depending on on, uh, on on where you are. And what you're worried about with the water is losing insulating property uh, of, of that material. And now you're not able to may retain any of that heat that you're generating and you're just losing heat uh, to the environment. You're, you're uh, giving heat off. And so that heat balance scale is way off and now your core temperature is going to start going down and you're moving towards hypothermic. Yeah. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that you've got to recognize it early if you're getting too warm. Yeah. Right. Don't get into a position where you're sweating like, mm -hmm. and, you're, and, and things are starting to get wet. Like take clothes off early. You know, I think that's the, that's the message I've told people that I've advised on this is, is if you are you're doing it to yourself, mm -hmm. I do. And sometimes it feels good. Like, oh man, I'm breaking a sweat. I'm climbing up this hill. I'm feeling good. And then, you know, you got to go down that hill. Oh. And, and now, you know, you, now you've lost the insulating property, but now you've gained a lot of heat transfer uh, via convection mm -hmm. and you're going to get really cold. So, you know, it's a pretty 
common thing for people to do is to you know have like a vest or a jacket or something well you take it off at the bottom of the climb put it in your pocket and when you get to the top then put it on yeah um you know if you've watched any pro cycling they've got a lot of little tricks that they do and sure. you know uh the newspaper down the front i've done that yeah so if you're if you're really stuck and you're in this situation mm -hmm. you got nothing else and you can find some like paper or you know there's fortunately there's garbage everywhere in our mm -hmm. <laughs> in our world find yourself a newspaper or a magazine or whatever and just shove it in your jersey yeah um that that'll sometimes that'll get you home um i've done that even with my uh, i've got caught out a few times where you know the weather changed and it started raining or something like that and you kind of get caught out you can do that and then uh plastic bags too just like, i i had to do that it got i was out on a long ride and i for whatever reason, just had the wrong hat and it was uh, windy and cold. Maybe I, got, I, I don't remember it rained, but I actually picked up a garbage bag that was on the side of the road, wrapped it in my helmet. Yep. And it was that, that actually helped a ton. So yeah. So don't be afraid to do like do do things like that. Um, I've been. It actually happened to me in the summer uh, when I was in the mountains mm -hmm. and I climbed up a nice big hill. And then the weather changed and a, and a cold front came in and I was at a ski lodge where I climbed up to and I just got a bunch of pamphlets and I just <laughs> shoved all the pamphlets in. And then but I recognized like my gloves, I, they were wet and my socks were wet. Yeah. So I went into the bathroom of the ski lodge, turned the heater on like the, the hand dryer, dried out my socks, dried out my gloves before I went down. And I was still cold, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too bad. You know, so, so these are all decisions we have to make. No, that's great. And, and those are really good practical tips and you gotta be prepared and you know, not proud, you know, just do it. Uh, because you, staying warm, keeping that heat balance is probably most important. But that's why this is a great, you know, uh, piece of, uh, of, of gear is something, you know, get a, a windproof jacket that you can just ball up and put in the back pocket, either take it with you or uh, take it off if you're uh, starting to to sweat too much, and then uh, don't don't let the sweat build up and get your your clothing wet. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so those are all really great practical tips. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, John, if, uh, in, in this is swimming. Mm -hmm. So, what do we do in training uh, when it's cold and we're gonna have to swim, or yeah, I guess in, in training in particular, we'll talk about we can we'll talk about racing and cold down the road. Um, is there any tips you have? So I take it you're talking about training in a pool outdoors. Yes, or or the lake, or so. And I and I'm gonna throw this out at you. So this uh, spring, uh, when everything was closed, right? COVID was closing everything. A lot of people went out to the lake really early yeah. to train. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the Pacific Ocean and got pseudo hypothermic several times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what are, you know, you swam in Norseman. Yeah. So, and I know that was a race, but like, let's say your only option is to train in a cold pool or mm -hmm. a cold lake. Not, so, so like racing, obviously, we're trying to go fast, right? Training is potentially a little bit different. So, um, if you're training in a pool, your pool is most likely heated here, you know, for in Vegas or any outdoor pool, and they're going to keep the water temperature probably around 80 degrees. Which yeah, is we're, that's not a problem. And so the trick with swimming in an outdoor heated pool is getting in and getting out. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's uh, 15 to 20 seconds of, uh, do I really want to do this? <laughs> that's right. So. You know, that's why swimmers typically have these wonderful swim parkas, you know, yep. bathrobes in essence. Uh, and then when you get in, just put it somewhere where you can get to it quickly afterwards uh, so you can uh, put it on and, and then get it indoors. But when swimming, you know, really the only piece of gear in a heated pool is um, still makes sense to wear a cap. Yep. And using a silicone cap uh, is actually probably a little better than even uh, just a, a, a regular latex clap. So, or sometimes double up on them, but, uh, but yeah, you can be very comfortable uh, in, in, a, in a heated pool because now really only thing that's being exposed is a little bit of your head or your head 
full head if you're stopped uh, in between sets, and then your arms. Uh, yeah. But no, no other special gear for heated pool. What about what so, about okay. not heated or the lake? All right. So going to a lake, uh, if the water temp is getting below 70, so now you're in the 60s, then what you know, you you've already made the decision to take your wetsuit. You, you know, don't leave your wetsuit home. Uh, really below 78, probably good to have a wetsuit, but low 70s, definitely have a wetsuit. Below 70s, yes, wetsuit. Uh, but then uh, you start looking at a thermal cap. And a thermal cap for swimming is a, is a neoprene covering. You put the neoprene covering on, it has a chin strap, most of them do. Some are Velcro, some are fixed. And then put your regular swim cap on top of that. Uh, and, and I, in both of those situations, I still like to put my goggles under both of those because then my seal of my goggle doesn't get interfered with, with either the neoprene or the, uh, or the latex cap. So I put my goggles on first, then I put the neoprene cap on and then the, uh, either the silicone or latex cap on top of that. Okay. And then uh, booties, gloves, yeah, then uh, people start to move in those directions. And, you know, the first choice is booties because uh, the rules are uh, pretty prohibitive on gloves unless the temperature gets really low. But what about, I'm just saying for training. Yeah, for training, I, you know, that's fine. I, I have only used neoprene gloves for scuba diving, not for, uh, not for swimming. Uh, but booties are, you know, they're good. One, they're comfortable getting in and out of the water because of all the rocks on the shore. That's actually nice to have a uh, little, little bit of an option. I've seen people do uh, surgical gloves. Oh, really? Yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, just, you know, one little bit more, one little layer, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, especially if they're nice and tight. Um, uh, I'll have to try that. I've not tried that. And even if you get a little water in there, it's probably going to, that, that water is going to stay a little bit warmer, right? So I, I've actually seen that. And uh, I considered it this summer when I was swimming in the Pacific. And it was, I think the, the lowest I swam, I think it was 50. Yeah, nice. And that was cold. Oh, that's cold. Yeah. I mean, not, yeah. under 60. Mon Monterey was really yeah. cold. Under 60, you got to, you really need to make smart gear choices. And, the, and, and you and I have talked about this before. The latex gloves are great for even cycling if you just want to real thin layer and you're not and maybe in a race you want to have something uh protecting you so something yeah. of a rubber I, glove is good yeah so you can, i mean give it a, give it a try but one other little tip i'll give you is if you're just training and you have the ability train when the sun is the highest train right. what's up if, if it's a sunny day mm. train when the sun is the highest oh. you still will get some radiant energy especially onto that black wetsuit on your back uh, you'll get a little bit more uh, heat. Uh, same thing like this summer when I was uh, in the Pacific. Um, that's what I would do. I was like, okay, when is the sun the absolute highest? And then the one day I was planning it all and I got in and then a cloud, the clouds came and it, it got significantly colder. Oh. It's, uh, it, it, once again, if that's just purely, uh, purely for training. Well, okay. So here's what's interesting is there is maybe one or two studies that have looked at radiant heat during swimming in a wetsuit. Okay. And uh, they actually were not necessarily measuring the radiant heat, but they were simulating radiant heat by having someone swim in a flume and then putting big um, lamps above the, uh, above the flume to try to simulate what it would be like to swim in, in radiant heat. We actually want to extend some of our work on core temp uh, by measuring the radiant heat. Just, you know, what happens when you, stand in the sun, yeah. uh, you know, how much does your core temp change, if at all? Uh, you know, core temp, as you mentioned, it's not, it's not a, um, it's pretty consistent and it takes a lot to nudge core temperature off in one direction or another. But once it starts moving in that direction, it goes, uh, you really gotta, you gotta be careful. Well, and I think that, you know, we'll, we'll do several more uh, talks on core temperature, but I think it's really important to understand that it's not the core temperature that makes you necessarily uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? It's your skin temperature. It's the perception. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you just that feeling you, you have all the cold receptors or temperature receptors uh, on your skin. That's what, that's what makes you feel cold. Yeah. So no, you're spot on. And so 
I'll, I'll quickly share. I know we could do more of this another day, but here's core temperature, my core temperature while doing Norseman. And this is using an ingestible pill. And you have to take that pill well before you're really interested in the, the temperature. So we take the temperature, in this case, took the pill uh, the night before. And then here's Norseman swim, which was um, 15 degrees Celsius, or actually just below that. So that's what, uh, 30, 30, 30. Oh, 15 degrees Celsius is 50. Yep, okay. So we're at 50, 55 degree temp water here. And you can see even in the, in the swim, my core temp isn't changing much. 37 is, you know, roughly normal body temperature. Uh, so not a lot of change in, in uh, core temp, but I was wearing a thermal uh, wetsuit. I was wearing a thermal cap. Uh, so I was pretty comfortable uh, in, in the gear I had. On the bike, you actually see lots of fluctuation in core temperature. And what's interesting here, you see that core temp dip at this point of the bike. Well, that was because it was raining and it was the uh, final descent uh, heading into uh, T2. And so now I'm not like you dropped almost two degrees. That's right. And I got cold and uh, it was again, it was rainy, but now you're going fast, you know, as well over 40 miles per hour. So now you've got a lot of wind blowing over you. You're, you're in essence have created a wind chill uh, factor and uh, the core temp actually dropped quite a bit. But then once I got to the flat area and was able to start pedaling again, then I was able to bring that, that core temp back up and then uh, then some changes of, of uh, core temp on the run. Uh, but, you know, again, this is, um, this is not a huge amount of, of change in core temperature uh, uh, on the run. So the interesting thing I see there, John, is, uh, you know, I know the course that you did, the hardest part of the course, you started, your temperature started going down. Mm -hmm. Was the ambient temperature going down? uh for on the run part on the last you know the last third of that run where you're basically climbing the yeah. mountain so uh this is going up gustatapen uh, which is uh, a big pile of rocks <laughs> and so i'm not moving very fast uh this is probably about nine or ten o'clock at night at this point okay. and so um but it's interesting that there was still daylight but not the sun was not up so you're right it was uh, it, it was a higher altitude, uh, it, and I was moving slower, uh, and and no real radiant heat uh, coming in at that point. So you know, dropping uh, environmental temperature there as well. So so yeah, that so that that that's interesting. And um, let me see here. Um, then, uh, oh, where's, oh, I had Loris. So, you know, Indian Wells is a popular race for uh, a lot yeah. of folks to do. And that's a mid-December race. Yeah, mid-December and a cold um, swim. And, oh, this isn't, yeah, I don't have this laid out very well. Uh, but we did uh, core temp for Lore because Lore, uh, struggles a bit in, um, in uh, cold, uh, in cold uh, races. And so she really spent a lot of time trying to make sure uh, she had the right gear, had the right um, swim gear, as well as the right uh, gear getting out of the swim. And so I don't have this all uh, labeled out, uh, but here's where she was uh, getting, this was her swim in this region, here's 37 again, very uh, manageable in the swim, but once she got out of the swim into T2 or T1, her yep. core temp dropped. And so that's, you know, a big issue that I've talked with athletes about is when you get out of the water, that's probably where you really need to pay attention to how to stay warm before you get biking. Because once she got on the bike, she's able to generate uh, heat through muscle contraction and, uh, and able to bring core temp back up. But it was that initial drop that was really uh, tough to manage and hard to change clothes and get, uh, get ready for the bike uh, when you're that cold. Absolutely. So it's neat, you know, thinking about the science behind uh, trying to stay warm as well and, 
have the ability to, to measure core temperature. That can yeah. be fun. Yeah, um, you know, we probably need to do a little bit more of that with some of these colder races, hopefully that, that happened this spring. You know, I'm even thinking, you know, if, if Oceanside goes off, it'd be really interesting to see that because that's a pretty cold swim, mm -hmm. but then it's a pretty tough bike. Yeah. And it's usually a hot, hot run. Mm -hmm. So that'd be really interesting to see, uh, see that one. No, that would. And, and uh, yeah, and that run is not necessarily hilly. It's got some good gradual climbs, but nothing... But it can get warm on that run for sure. Yeah. So I think that would be a good one. Um, you know, I'm planning on doing uh, the 70.3 in St. George. That's another one with a really cold swim. Mm -hmm. And then it could be a 90 degree run. Well, and so now uh, we probably need to at least talk a little bit about racing in the cold versus training in the cold because training in the cold, I'll put anything on. <laughs> you know, I don't care. Exactly. But racing in the cold, that's a little different, but the big thing that I tell people is don't dress as if you're going to Kona. Yeah. <laughs> you got to find the right gear for the, uh, for them, for the race environment that you're racing in. No, for sure. And, you know, and understand that you could lose a lot of time by being too cold. Yep. Right. Probably more than the arrow penalty uh, of putting something a little bit warmer on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it always takes me back to the stories of uh, that, you know, the, the 70.3 in Boise, where some of the pros rode the bike in the wetsuits. That's right. You know, and in and, and, and reality, that was probably the smartest thing they could have done. Because mm -hmm. you know, it was a cold, rainy uh, bike ride and the, and the water temperature was really cold. Um, you know, you make these, you make the decisions, right, to, to be warm rather than potentially be the most comfortable. Yeah. Um, and uh, and really, it's it's the bike that's the problem. I and mean, you mentioned the T one. You know, I would advise somebody in a cold race like that, especially in an Ironman, to dry off. Yeah. Like have a towel. Take the minute. Mm -hmm. Dry off as much as you can. Yeah. You know, because especially on that first K on the bike or mile on the bike, when you're you know that water's coming off of you, it's taking it's taking heat with you, right? And because uh, that, that evaporation is pulling away, it's pulling away heat. Yep. So I think that that's very important. And then use the right kit. So I uh, hopefully have probably one of five of these. There's only five made. This is my Norseman long sleeve uh, kit. Yep. And it was made specifically for Norseman because one, you're, it could rain, it could be humid. Could be warm, you know, not, not you know, warm for Norway is a little different than warm for Vegas, but um, but you know, have the right the right gear that that you're right. You you don't want to be wet coming out of T1. Uh, yeah, it's it's worth it's in my experiences when I've been raced in cold, it's worth the time, mm -hmm. right? Because there's nothing worse than you know, even in an Olympic race, an hour on the bike being cold, you know. I, I can also tell you this, that um, your feet may not warm up mm -hmm. during the entire time. Even if you have thermal stuff on, um, I'll tell you a funny, a funny story. Uh, this was three or four years ago. I raced in Lake Havasu in that first race of the year. It was like mid-March and it, the water was cold. It was in the fifties. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and the bike was, it was not very warm and for sure it was probably in the sixties when we were riding. And I get off and I'm running and having a pretty good run. And I'm about a K in. And all of a sudden I was like, oh man, I got a rock in my shoe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you, you know the course, but you have to go up and down the stairs at the London Bridge. Mm -hmm. So about two thirds of the way up the stairs, I'm like, oh, okay, this will be a good place to stop. I stop, whip my shoe off, and I'm like, no rock. Check my sock. Or no, I had no socks. I had no socks because it was only big distance. Felt the bottom of my foot, no rock. Oh, it must have fell off and I took my shoe off. Okay, good go up the rest of the stairs, run across the bridge. I'm like, dang it, there's, a, there's something in my shoe. Stop again. Look, there is literally nothing in my shoe. It was just, you know, that sensation of you get, you know, that you get when your feet are basically, you know, unthawing. Um, they're not really unthawing, but when they're, when they're warming up. So little tip for you, if it's really cold and your feet are kind of frozen and you're running, it's probably not a rock in your shoe. Don't waste your time. Uh, 
just uh just it, it, it will go away but uh that's a, a little pro tip for people no that's so true and i think um a lot of locals experienced something like that at sand hollow yep i think it was just it was last year it was really cold and even after doing the Olympic distance, uh, I don't think I felt my feet until uh, well after the race. It was just, it was that cold. And yeah. everyone was was uh, was expressing their love for that. So <laughs> yeah. that's just something to, you know, to, to, to be prepared for. And, and like you said, like having the right kit on the bike and like we already mentioned, having the, the hand warmers. Yeah. Um, I've even done, uh, so in my, usually when I race uh, in the cold, it, and actually there's a lot of races and even not so cold if the water is going to be cold i'll still have the toe covers on my cycling mm -hmm. shoes, and i'll put the hand warmers in the toe covers yeah so that just that little bit of temperature and i put them in like before i go down to the to the water so then when i put my shoes on they're warm oh nice right and yes. you get this that little sensation that's a little bit warmer yeah and uh, you know, it's just and it's little things like that that you know they take it takes years to of experience and talking to people and and John, we're giving this stuff away just so you know right. all of our right. all of our awesome tips. But people need to practice it too. And, oh, for sure. uh, and especially if you're going to try to implement something uh, on race day, uh, because I did make a mistake, uh, and and I've told you about this one at Northman where I wanted to change clothes in T1. Uh, and but Norseman did not have any change intent, yep. And and uh, I, I still didn't give it too much thought, but then all of a sudden, I was trying to put on my uh tri gear wet and I did not dry off. Oh, my gosh, it was so hard to get this kit on this one right here, uh, when I was wet, and I was it was such a struggle. Uh, so I but you know, silly me, I never even tried putting it on wet, so. You get, you know, the funny thing is you've done it before in other races where you try to get socks on i'm sure when your feet were wet and you know how hard it is yeah right let alone the full tri kit yeah that, that would be tough for sure so try everything out obviously everyone always says nothing new on race day for the most the problem is is that a lot of times you you're not going to be in these situations right where it's like it's you know oftentimes we travel to a race and or we're looking at you know a race in the future and like oh it's going to be kind of cold there but it's not cold now, so you, you don't. No, that's right, and, and you're right about that. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that with uh, Northman, I did do a lot of gear checking uh, yeah. at a time, you know, yeah. checking out the pants, checking out the gator, you know, the, the you know, waterproof uh, gaiters for the feet, different gloves. I tried all that. I just never tried that, put them on my tri suit wet. <laughs> <laughs> So there's it's, always one, one, one chink in the armor. That's right. Sure. You gotta, you gotta keep, but it, it, you know, when you have a race like that or, you know, any race that you've got a, you know, special environmental things, you really got to take, take the time to plan for it. And then you'll have an enjoyable experience. So, Absolutely. but you also got to be adaptable and that's the, uh, the other challenge is yep. nothing new on race day, but you got to adapt. The one last thing I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to say is you also have to be mentally strong. Yeah. Right. When the conditions, especially racing and training, when they're bad, they're bad for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I you know, often think of this in a race. It's like, you know, if you're in a race and it's cold, it's windy, or it's hot and humid, there's a, a high percentage of people that mentally quit before they even start. Mm -hmm. And just do your best to be mentally prepared and mentally tough enough to understand that like it's not going to be a hard day for everybody it's not just a hard day for you That's right right it's a hard day for everybody but when you conquer those days mm -hmm. and when you get through them and then you get to get on a podcast with your friend and talk about them yeah, that's right. <laughs> those are the, the, the like that's the that's the cool part about sport i tell you what, triathlon is really easy when it's 68 degrees and no wind and a sunny day Mm -hmm. And on your and, and your run has got shade, mm -hmm. right? And the path is soft, yeah. and the roads are perfect, it, and it, the lake is glass. Yeah. But but how many you know how many times have, have, have has that does that happen? I, mean, I can think of out of the probably the seventy five triathlons I've done or so, maybe five times it's been like that. 
it's always something. You know, and, and that compresses people. It, it brings, you know, the, the harder the conditions, the more uh, breadth of, uh, of yep. work experiences you have. And uh, yeah, I, I relish the, uh, the challenges like that. Those, those are fun. I do too. Um, you know, I, I don't run, I'm like everybody else. I'm checking the weather constantly uh, coming up to a race, but you know, a crummy weather race, I don't know. I, I think it just adds something to it. Well, and, and that's why I, you know, I'm really, I start, I, I don't have a lot of regrets, but you know, I do wish that I did Tahoe, you know, when yep. it's just a crazy time. And I, I do, uh, you wish I had done the St. George race when it was, uh, it well, that crazy day when everyone didn't finish. I mean, boy, that's just, that, that, those are, those are stories that you remember forever. So. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, we've been, uh, we've been at this for just over an hour. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Yeah. All right. Stay warm during yep. training. Don't get wet during training. Yeah. Race day, plan it out. And uh, my advice for you, if you don't want to invest in all the gear and do all those things, just train inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. We'll have, a, we'll have another podcast. Uh, I, I see it in our future of uh, you know, training inside and what we can do and, and the, the most efficient ways to set it up. I've had several people recently ask me like, hey, how do I get a, a good indoor setup for, especially for biking? So we'll have a, we'll, we will have a podcast on that coming up. Coming well, up. okay, so let me just throw out, I am doing more indoor training right now on my bike, but only because I'm having to watch my vintage trailer classes and getting, uh, there's a whole archive of all these, how to restore your vintage trailer. And uh, I've been uh, trying to play, I've been <laughs> watching all these, so. Being on the bike and being able to watch a video is uh, actually works out pretty good. <laughs> you know, I, I'd also say that, you know, you and I are both in a situation where we're just not commuting. Yeah, that's right. We both do a lot of commuting and, um, you know, it, so it's, well, if I get an hour commute, my commute is about an hour. Yeah. Well, I can just jump on the trainer for an hour. It's yeah. just so much, it's easier. It's not like, and I'm still commuting. I'm just, you know, because I my where I'm working, my office is where my trainer is. So. I just, I just have to you know go over there to get to it so yeah. all right john well thanks that was so fun tonight uh yeah. happy black friday oh question for you uh was there some good black friday deals in your uh trailer uh renovation yeah no i i paint tanks or anything uh i tried to watch for black friday detail or uh, deals for some of my gear that i need but I'm trying to do this in stages too. I'm, okay. I, I'm not ready to do a big uh, purchase on some of the peripherals for the trailer. I'm still trying to put it together so I can use it. <laughs> it's still exploded in my backyard. <laughs> Lovely. All right, awesome. Nice talking to you. Have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you next week. All right, sounds good.